Hello. <laughs> well, thanks for coming, and um, it's lovely to be at EMF. Um, just waiting for the slides to appear. Uh, while they're coming, I can't see the slides. Oh, they're over there. <laughs> I was waiting for them to come over here. <laughs> um, <laughs> very technical, yes. Um, so, this is a story I want to share about a certain life. It's about life of a person who was active about 50, 60 years ago, but I think would have been very at home at EMF. And I'd like you to start by picturing a scene. October 1950, far away from the cares of the atomic research establishment, a pantomime cow is eating a radioactive lunch. And this cow stands up on its hind legs and rubs its belly and smiles as something runs across the stage. It's um, somebody in parachute silk called Atom Man. And Atom Man kneels before another character, also in parachute silk, Knowledge. And Knowledge rubs the cow's head, who's had the radioactive meal, and says he will soon be a very healthy animal. And as soon as this happens, um, 12 women in ball gowns dance, sort of pirouette behind them both, in the manner of neutrinos. Now, this did actually happen in October 1950 in the Waldorf Hotel in London, right in the middle of London's theatre district. And um, we don't know whether this ballet, Isotopia, an exhibition in atomic structure, ex ex exposition in atomic structure, ever saw the light of day again after it was seen that particular day by a rapt audience of 250 women from the Ladies Atomic Society and a totally dumbfounded journalist from Time magazine. In fact, there's very, very little we know about this ballet at all, except for a few fragments of it that are left in the British Library. In the same way, there's very little we know about its creator, Muriel Howarth, but she's somebody that I've been trying to sort of piece together the life of from the fragments. What we need to know about Howarth was that she was a choreographer and a composer. I mean, she put this whole thing together. She did the stage notes, she did the libretto, she did the music. She was also a science fiction novelist who was published, and crucially, she was also an amateur atomic physicist and evangelist for the atomic age. And as I've been trying to piece Howard's extraordinary story together, I've been thinking about the isotope and the half-life of the isotope. And I've also been thinking about the half-life of stories of people like Muriel. So these are amazing people that were explorers of some kind or another who weren't properly recorded in the history books. And what's her half-life? How quickly is her story fading? And what can we do about it? So we've only got tantalizing little glimpses of what she was up to. Here she is in 1949, presenting a lithium atom to an astounded and thrilled mayor of Eastbourne. And um, she was very fond of curiosities and had a great eye for the theatrical. And the other thing she did for the mayor is she produced a baked potato from her handbag. It's all on record. A baked potato from a handbag that was six weeks old and proceeded to eat it. And the reason she did this was that the baked potato had been irradiated. It had been battered with gamma rays to sterilize it so she could eat it. And that was an extraordinary thing at the time. And she loved stuff like that. So we've got all these sort of little tantalizing tidbits about her. And the one I find most interesting of all, and I have many theories about what she was entirely about, was that she actually worked in the war in the Ministry of Supply, and she got quite a sort of, for her intellect, quite a demeaning job. She was asked to look after the supply of hosiery for women. But they soon clicked that she was a really smart cookie, so much so that although she had no formal training in physics, they told her to swiftly gen up on atomic physics and explain it to the masses. And this she did with a plomp right through into peacetime. 
And this brings us straight away to one of her most ambitious stunts of all. And this became public when she, um, when she was reported in the um, Sunday Dispatch by um, somebody called Beverly Nichols, who was the sort of Alan Titchmarsh of his age. And he basically said that, um, yesterday I held in my hand something extraordinary. It was a thing from outer space. There's been nothing like it before. And um, it is the world's first atomic peanut. And this is what she did. She actually grew her own atomic peanuts. And here she is sort of tickling them on her, on her balcony in Eastbourne. And um, these weren't just any old peanuts. As you can see, they were very, very large. And this is what it was all about. These were grown from a seed called NC4X. These were atom-blasted peanuts. So what happened was she wrote to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, home of the uh, atom bomb in America, um, where they were experimenting with atom blasting. And they were taking seeds of ordinary things and then they were giving them a complete battering with radiation, hoping that something extraordinary would happen to their DNA. And it was like a sort of um, pig in a poke. You didn't know what you were going to get. You'd get um, some atom-blasted seeds, and there'd be a lot of mutants in there. Some would just be twisted. Some would be wrecked. Some would smell awful. Some would grow in weird colours. But if you grew millions and millions of these seeds, you might get lucky. You might find the golden mutant, the mutant with the property that you really, really want. Now, I spoke to Paige Johnson, who's another historian of um, Howarth about this, and she put it like this, if today's genome editing is snipping the genome with scissors, um, atom smashing was more like bashing the genome with a hammer. And in fact, it's called in sort of modern circles, spray and pray. <laughs> And this, I have so many theories about um, the true nature of what Howarth was up to with the government, but we've only got little tantalizing snippets. But we do know that she, for some reason, ended up at a UN event in America where she got to eat something made from atom-blasted seeds. And this is how she got into it, and this is how she got them. So yes, so these were her wonderful these were her wonderful atom-blasted seeds, her um, giant mutant peanuts. And um, she had an eye operation in 1920, and um, this caused a bit of a problem for her. And she didn't want, um, by about 1950, she didn't want her, um, she didn't want her plants to sort of wither and die while she wasn't able to look after them. So she had a bit of a plan. She remembered that um, a little bit down the road from uh, Eastbourne, uh, was this place in Polgate called the Wonder Village. And it was a place where you'd go and have strawberries and you'd see sort of rabbits running about and there'd be a maze. And there was also Fred Slaymaker's Wonder Village, which was a little um, a miniature town, sort of playing with scale. And so basically she sort of said to them, you know, I've got my weird peanut, you've seen it in the papers, can you look after it while I'm in hospital? And they said yes, so they put it in the cactus house. And not surprisingly, it drew one hell of a crowd. So much so that they decided to forget about the rabbit warren and give it to Muriel. And she opened in this little, this little sort of uh, day out place in uh, Eastbourne, the world's first atomic garden. And the public would go along and they would see Oak Ridge's atom blasted seeds and they'd see, you know, stuff like this one, which, you know, as you can see, it's an atom en energized dwarf tomatoes. And if you read, it says, note early fruit and sturdy plant needs no support. And, you know, people just sort of went to see this as a curiosity in the way they went to see other curiosities. So, I mean, this was pretty good going for somebody who had no keys to the lab, no formal training. But she wasn't happy with that. She wasn't happy with just growing other people's gear because Muriel had a plan. Muriel had lived through the Second World War. She'd lived through rationing. She understood the privations of hunger and rationing. And she decided that she needed to find the golden mutant. And that golden mutant was the giant mutant vegetable that would cure world hunger. But she didn't have a lab. So this is how she went about it. 
from her home in Eastbourne. She commissioned Oak Ridge to send her lots and lots of atom blasted seeds, and she set up a mass experiment all the way around the UK, sort of citizen science, atomic physics experiment that anybody could join for the price of a few first class stamps. And you'd send off to Muriel and her husband, the major, and he would send you back some seeds and you would grow them and you would report on them. And every month there'd be a competition, a peanut prize for the person that was growing the biggest mutant. And she thought that if she got enough people doing this, eventually between them, citizen scientists could solve world hunger. And so I find this fascinating because, you know, um, there are so many resonances with, you know, the kind of stuff we're seeing here today. I mean, this was amateur scientists just getting on with the job that they saw was a techno fix for one of the biggest problems of the age. And it was open source. For a few shillings, she'd send you all the details you needed to know. She'd tell you what atomic physics was about, what the radiation could do, how to grow your plants, where they came from. Everything you needed to know, she told you. And she even wrote a book, Atomic Gardening for the Layman, where she explained how all of this could be done. So, I mean, I find this a wonderful, I, I find this wonderful because I think um, this was a really pioneering example of citizen science. And I also find it quite interesting and perhaps in some ways troubling. And I think that's because, um, for me, Howarth was an absolute classic techno-utopian, somebody who saw a massive problem in society and thought that a technical fix was a solution. And, and um, I'm fascinated by techno-utopia because um, I'm the subject of a techno-utopian experiment myself. So I was born in the late 60s, and I was born in a test town for fluoride. Now, the fluoride story, for those of you who don't know, fluoride is when uh, the government put fluoride into your water supply to strengthen your teeth. And this was a totally new thing in the 60s in the UK. Nobody was doing it at all. And as far as we were concerned at school, we were the very first generation to have fluoride in the water. And we thought we were like the chosen ones, because, you know, you have the dentist come to school every six months to check your teeth and all of that, and lots and lots of uh, measurements were done. But it's a bit of a murky story, the fluoride story, and it kind of points to the murkiness of some sort of techno-utopianism, because what was going on there? Well, first of all, you would like to think they thought really, really hard before they put a known toxin into the water supply. And to this day, I, 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 I trust that they did. But I went and had a little look in the uh, National Archive, because, you know, it's a story that is, interests me personally. And um, it was interesting that there was a lot of resistance to this fluoride going in for obvious reasons. And the government were also quite worried, because a lot of tea drinkers in Watford, and they were worried that we would overdose. Um, but anyway, they did it anyway, and there was a lot of resistance. So how they handled it was um, they didn't say anything. They kind of went quiet for a while, and then one day they said, oh, you've all been drinking it for three weeks. And um, then, then lots of people phoned into the local radio to say their budgets had fallen off their perches and all of that. But anyway, we survived, and, you know, I've got really good teeth. Who knows what else is coming down the line, but I've got really good teeth. But this is where the techno-utopianism doesn't really work for me, because what was going on with that fluoride? In 1960, the average five-year-old in the UK had five rotten teeth. Now, why was that? It was because we were all eating junk, sugar, processed food. Those of us who weren't healthy, weren't, weren't um, wealthy enough, weren't getting enough fruit and veg in our diet. And the government weren't ready to stand up to the sugar barons. They weren't ready to tackle inequality that was leading to food poverty and time poverty. They just weren't ready to be assertive about the cause of the problem. And they let the time bomb tick, and what do we have now? We have an obesity and a heart disease epidemic in this country. What did they do instead? They went for the techno fix. They shored up people's teeth, and it worked really, really well. We've all got fantastic teeth but they didn't do the hard yards, they didn't solve the problem. So this is why sometimes um, quick technical fixes like murials and like the fluoride story are, can be problematic. Now here's another that, um, does anybody have any sort of personal recollection of this one? 
Okay, well, um, did anybody have a guess what language this is? English, yeah, this is actually, um, to be precise, it's called Saxon Spanglish. And around the time of the tea problem, there was also a problem with literacy in this country, very high numbers of illiteracy um, among sort of under 10s. So um, Pittman came along, a man who invented shorthand and his company, they came along and said, well, rather than go for sort of evidence-based teaching and try and teach more, you know, put the work in to teach more children to read, traditional problematic English, which you know is all phonetic and tricky. Let's change what they call orthography. Let's change the way English is written out to make it easier. So they invented a whole load of new letters, which they sort of borrowed from phonetics, and they made out, I can't remember how many, it was like 47 word um, alphabet, which they called Saxon Spanglish. And if anybody wants to meet me outside, I've got some Saxon Spanglish books with me. And yes, these were easier to read because they were phonetic, but obviously there was a very, very big catch. Because what happened was, if you were a Saxon Spanglish school, um, and, there were, and it was a mass experiment with Saxon Spanglish in the mid 60s, if you were at a Saxon Spanglish school, you got to year three, and that was the terrible year. Your teacher came in and said, all that stuff you've done really well with, all that stuff you've learnt, it's not really like that. And then they sort of pulled the board round, and then you'd have to sort of adjust to um, traditional orthography, you know, to traditional problematic, messy English. And it put a lot, a lot of children off course and completely killed their confidence. I met a professor who, um, a very accomplished professor who to this day has problems um, with reading and writing. And he was, um, I'm going to use the word victim of Saxon Spanglish. And he, the day that the board got spun round and he was told that Saxon Spanglish wasn't a real language, um, was also, um, left him anxious for the whole of the rest of his school time. That there was going to be the day when the teacher came in and told him that maths wasn't really like that or geography wasn't really like that. So it was a very sort of destabilising thing. And here's the other catch with this techno-utopianism. You know, follow the money. What was going on with here? Well, Pittman was selling these books and he'd got, them, got the, all these schools locked into his system. If you wanted to learn Saxon Spanglish, which was the solution to the uh, uh, illiteracy problem, you had to buy his books, so he had a lot of money to make from it. So the whole thing was very murky, and not surprisingly, it got parked quite swiftly. So anyway, just going back to uh, Muriel, well, how did she do? Well, not great, because the odds were stacked against her, because if you think about it, she had to have millions of seeds to find that golden mutant. And so she really had to marshal an awful lot of people, which she didn't. She didn't get like thousands and thousands. She got a few hundred sort of volunteers. And um, this sort of, again, reminds me of the sort of tech community about the gatekeepers, the lurkers and the gatekeepers. If you imagine these people were um, her sort of acolytes and she was the gatekeeper of her community, she was a very snippy gatekeeper. And she used to make people, when they came to her meetings, wear a badge at all times that showed their level of expertise, so you, know, you weren't allowed to talk out of line. And she sent very, very testy notes to everybody. I mean, it's hilarious when you sort of see her correspondence. So not surprisingly, she didn't exactly sort of win hearts and minds, and slowly, slowly, the sort of experiment sort of quietly fizzled out. Meanwhile, she was writing very testy notes, very angry notes, to the people that were dabbling in chemical splicing of the genome, which he thought was a complete waste of space. But of course, history won out there, and that is ultimately what we did. So it's an example of somebody who was a brilliant thinker, brilliant scientist, but perhaps um, was lacking in some of the sort of social nows about how to run an experiment like that and, and sort of um, win over a community to actually make it happen. And I contrast her, interestingly, with um, other groups that were sort of pioneering, like um, the EAW, I'm very fond of the EAW, Electrical Association for Women, who were around in the 30s, who were, who were pioneering electricity in the home and made beautiful badges. And um, they were, um, they were evangelising about electricity in the same way that Howarth was evangelising about the atom and the peaceful uses of it. And um, they did very well. So first of all, they educated themselves and others, as you can see. And they did wonderful things like um, 
Again, this, this would be very home at EMF, you know, you don't own a product unless you can fix it. So um, if anybody wants to come out later, I've got one of these tea towels, which was kindly given to me by Andrew Back, who runs Wuthering Bites. Um, they, they used to make things like tea towels that told you how to mend your equipment at home. And um, they kind of, they understood how to sort of work the system and get people to see what they were doing. So in like 1930, they put all their money into actually building this wonderful Corbusian show home in Bristol. It's, sort of, it's just sort of like landed like a spaceship in sort of Tudorbethan suburb of uh, Bristol. And in it, it was full of all these electrical wonders, like the Thor Electric Servant, which was a food mixer, which could double as a washing machine. And, um, and it was a very sort of, on the one hand, it was a very middle class venture because they were talking about the electric servant. Because of course, this was, they were working in the 30s, just after the First World War, when there was the servants' crisis, when lots of uh, men and women, particularly the men, came back from the front and didn't want to go back into service. They thought, you know, stuff that for a game of soldiers. And so there weren't, weren't enough public, there weren't enough people in service. And so there was a sort of a, a sort of technical, again, it was seen as a techno fix, let's, let's give people electrical servants instead. But actually they went further than that. They did wonderful things like this pioneering kitchen in the um, 20s, which was um, based on sort of Frankfurt designs of sort of rational kitchen design. It might not look that rational, but compared to a Victorian kitchen, believe me, this is a really rational kitchen. And they were trying to sort of borrow ideas from people like Gilbreth, who were involved in the sort of scientific study of movement, and trying to, I mean, it was weird, it was sort of like trying to sciencify domest the domestic zone as though you needed to sort of sciencify it to sort of justify it. So again, it's a sort of double-edged thing. But what they were doing is they were, they were looking for ways to, in this case, literally eliminate wasted motion, like movement around the kitchen, to give people what they called more happiness minutes so that they had um, a better life. And you know, it might sort of seem sort of twee and daft, but actually, if you ever have lived in one of the sort of post-war council houses in the UK, they had wonderful, wonderful kitchens that were like head and shoulders above what was in the private homes. And that's because the EAW infiltrated the government and worked on those kitchen designs and got them really, really good. And they did give people more happiness minutes. But again, theirs was interesting because they were campaigning. They, they had a big thing, in the same way that Muriel had this world hunger thing. Theirs was a big thing. They had lived through suffrage. They had got the vote, but it hadn't given them enough. And they had this idea that if they could electrify the home and give women more minutes in the day, that the women could leave the home more often and, and join the club, or more importantly, go into parliament. And they kind of saw electricity as a sort of means of liberation. Whereas actually, of course, the sort of, um, the, sci the science of um, scientific management of labor that they were borrowing ideas from, of course, itself was a double-edged sword, because what it actually ended up with, with for a lot of men and women was a, was a um, atomization of you know, labor into sort of boring, repetitive tasks. So again, it's never sort of clear cut that, that uh, um, injecting some tech into something is going to give you the solution when actually you want a, lo a larger societal tackling of something. And I think about that now, by the way, when I listen to what's going on with the Paris Accord. I mean, I was frightened when I spoke to my very good friend, James Dyke, who's uh, um, a professor of um, climate change, planetary dynamics. And, and this might be obvious to you, but it was like gobsmacking for me to hear this, is that this target that we've got, whether it's one and a half degrees or two degrees, reaching that is contingent on a techno fix. It's contingent on us inventing carbon capture tech that isn't here yet. So we're not doing the hard yards and thinking, well, how do we change society? to bring down our carbon footprint. No, <laughs> we're all sort of pretending Father Christmas or Mother Christmas is gonna arrive with this techno fix and it ain't here yet. Anyway, little addendum about Muriel. Here's some irradiated tomatoes. And of course we can have, um, we do have irradiated food now. It's used really just to sort of sterilize things and increase their shelf life. And you know, and here's somebody being playful with some cobalt 60 sauce. 
And um, what I find very interesting is when I look at a photo like this, because, of course, we could genome sequence so fast now that you can do spray and pray. So here's a field, and in the middle of the field is a cobalt-60 source, very, very toxic source, which they can sort of lower into a sarcophagus when they venture into the field. And around it, they've got all their mutants, all their mutant, or, you know, their atom-smashed seeds, and they're just growing and hoping within that they're going to find something of interest. And they can genome sequence really, really fast to help with that process. So spray and pray has now become viable again. And here's the most wonderful thing about this, and I think, I think Muriel would have been delighted to have seen this photo, because this is what was a plate in one of her books. This was Muriel's plan for a cobalt-60 garden, and it did precisely that. So the idea was there's that cobalt-60 source, so, you know, a radioactive source, bathing all her plants all the time in radiation to try and mutate them in an interesting way. And then when she wanted to venture into her garden, it would plunge into some sort of lid sarcophagus so she could go in. So there's a story of Muriel, what an amazing woman, so amateur scientist, pioneer of citizen science, pioneer of open source science, and how much more would she have achieved if they'd in the first place given her the keys to the lab? Thank you.